Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. And again, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are out in television, we're glad to have you with us. And for those of you here in the studio, again, we always appreciate so much your coming in. And uh, I've had the studio class turn to Romans chapter 1 once again. But for those of you on television, we going to let you know for a few programs in a row that we do have all of these videotapes ready to mail. And we've uh, put 12 programs on one six-hour video in order to hold the costs down. And of course, each video has now been transcribed word by word. In fact, I've told the people, and I've even told Keith as he prepared, take out some of my superfluous words. Take out some of my now-thens and uh, what have you, because I know I will use them. But he said, then it wouldn't be less Feldick. So uh, the little books are just word for word as they come off the tape. And uh, we trust that since a lot of other folk have been blessed by them, if you haven't gotten any, you call us or write to us, and we'll get you something in the mail. As I mentioned last program, the first thing we like to suggest is let us just send you a list of all the table of contents of all the various videos and where they happen to be covering the scripture and uh, then you can order from that. Some people would just as soon get maybe uh, old tapes 11, 12, and 13, I guess, 14. Those are the ones that we did on Revelation. And uh, I suppose we've sent more of them out than any other one. But whatever, we just want our television audience to know that these are available. Now I think we'll get right back into the book and uh, pick up where we left off. And I probably should stop right here, and from here until we get to chapter 3, God is, in so many words, building his case, just like a prosecuting attorney. God is building his case against the whole human race, and he's going to categorize them into three areas. We're looking now, first and foremost, at the first one that he is going to conclude as being guilty, and that is the immoral, or maybe I should even say the amoral. They have no morals whatsoever. They're destitute of any morality. Then we're going to come in the next series of verses to the moral man or woman. And then we're going to come to, believe it or not, the religious individual. And the conclusion is going to be on all three guilty. And then Paul is going to come to that tremendous conclusion in Romans 3, there is none that doeth good. There is none that doeth righteousness. They are all become unprofitable. So as we come into this next series of verses, again, I always like to remind my audience, my classes, and I'm not looking down my nose, I'm not judging, I'm just simply showing what the Scripture says, and it is God building his case now against all of humanity, but he's going to start with those, of course, who are most obvious, obviously guilty, and that is the immoral. Now, we saw just a little bit in our closing remarks in the last program, verse 24, because they now push God out of their thinking, they have now begun to worship anything and everything but the one true God. And as a result, they open themselves up to the immoral lifestyle. I read an article here a year or two ago by a university secular individual. He was not writing with any, I don't like the word religious, but once in a while you have to use it. He was not writing with any religious overtones. But he made the statement that unless a society is guided and controlled by religious values, they cannot last. Even if it's a religion that you and I would not agree with, it still has guidelines that keeps those people under a certain spectrum of behavior, which you have to have or you can't have a society. 
When you fall into anarchy, when you fall into no restraint, you can't last. It, it's just that simple. No nation ever has. Rome. Rome is a good example. The Roman Empire. My, they had the greatest military machine at that time. And yet Rome, the city itself, became so corrupt politically, economically, and morally that nobody had to come in and whip them. They defeated themselves, and Rome fell. And of course, that's what historians have been screaming about America. We're going down the same road that Rome went, and we're going to destroy ourselves, not with some outside power coming in and taking us over. We're going to destroy ourselves from within. All right, so now we're going to build the case, or God does, against the immoral segment of humanity. Verse 24, as we looked at last program, wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts or the desires of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Well, there was nothing to refrain, to restrain them because they were now under nothing more than idolatry. And idolatry has no moral code. In fact, I've often told my classes over the years, if you go back and you study idolatrous and uh, some of the mythological religions of the world, at the very core of their operating is immorality. The pagan temples of the old Greek and Roman gods were just glorified houses of prostitution in the name of religion, see? And so it just followed that when you come from the idolatry of verse 23, you now come to the immorality of verse 24. But you see, mankind is never satisfied to stay on this level. He is determined to what... I remember one young medical student who was... Uh, how should I say? He was struggling with the meager income that he had at that time, uh, nothing like what they are now. He was an intern, not a student. He was an intern. And at that time, I think they were making about $25 a month and just struggling, and he was married. And he says, you know, Les, I've come to the conclusion the only way to really get wealth in this world is to do something that contributes to the degeneracy of society. And then he named them. Alcohol, prostitution, gambling. I was thinking he had four, and I my thing. But see, anything that degenerate society, people are going to buy it. I remember telling, having somebody tell me back in the Depression, all of these same things, people had money for that. They didn't have money for food and shelter and clothes for their kids, but they had money for their booze. They had buddy money for their immorality. And so it's always been, and I guess it always will be, until finally the wrath of God is going to fall. All right, now then go on to verse 25. Now, from that level of immorality, sexual immorality between the male and the female, now they change the truth of God into the lie. Now, here again, the truth, I think, you can always put in the very name of Christ himself. He is the truth. But you see, Jesus put his stamp of approval upon the marriage relationship, didn't he? God put his stamp of approval upon the marriage relationship way back in the garden. And so all the way through Scripture, Paul says in Hebrews, the marriage bed is undefiled. God says it's honorable in all. And so under God's restraints, all these things are perfectly not only normal, they're what God has given. But you see, man has taken the God-given things and has used it under the influence, of course, of the adversary of Satan. So they changed the truth of God into a lie, worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. And now again, the Scripture says, God gave them up to a yet lower level of lifestyle, and now what is it? Vile affections. Now, we don't like these languages. I don't. But the book has got it, and we have to teach it. So as a result of their original behavior of rejection, God now gives them up to even something worse. Now they go into vile affection. Even 
their women. Now, I don't like to put any connotation on here that is not as it should be. But you'll note that Satan started with the woman in the garden. And this is not a put down to our, to our women, not at all. It's just a fact of human history. Satan started with the woman. And you watch even through Israel's history. In fact, I can take you back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 44. A lot of times I don't intend to do this. Jeremiah 44, because I don't want somebody to say, where do you get that? Well, I get it from the book or I wouldn't speak it. Jeremiah 44. Drop down to verse 15. Jeremiah 44, verse 15. Now, this is Israel, God's covenant people, who had the temple right in their midst, had the priesthood, had a good part of the Old Testament. And look what they're doing. Chapter 44, verse 15, Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods. Who was burning the incense? The women were, the wives. And all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelled in the land of Egypt and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, <clears throat> As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we'll not hearken unto you. Got the attitude? We're not going to listen to what you've got to say. I always like to remind my classes, you know, Jeremiah lived at the time of the Babylonian siege. And when the Babylonians finally took over J Jerusalem, where do you suppose they found Jeremiah? Well, he was down in a dungeon. Why? The Jews didn't like what he said. And so rather than listen to his prophecies, rather than adhere to what God was trying to tell them, they threw him in prison. And that's where the Babylonians found him. But see, this is the why he's called the weeping prophet. He could see what Israel was heading into. And they're going deeper and deeper into these same kind of sins that we're going to see in Romans 1. All right, now look at verse 17. But they said, We will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the, not the king of heaven, but the what? The queen of heaven. Oh, who was that? Well, a female goddess. And every great idolatrous religion has their female goddess. It's been part and parcel of idolatry from day one. Well, we won't take time to read the rest of these, but I just wanted you to see it was the women of Israel who led the way, and it was precipitated by the worship of a female goddess. All right, so verse 26 of Romans 1. It starts not with the men, but with the women. <laughs> who entered into a homosexual relationship. Rather than that which was even natural immorality up in verse 24, now they go into the vile affections of the homosexual lifestyle. And so their women did change the natural use, that is, of sexual intercourse, into that which is against nature. The book said it. I didn't. Verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men. Plain enough, come back to Genesis 19. And this is the first time that the Scripture deals with what God calls an abomination. It's what it was then, it's been ever since, and it still is. Genesis 19. Verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. Now remember, these two angels back in chapter 18 were called what? Come back to chapter 18, verse 2. 
Genesis 18, verse 2. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men. Got that? One was the Lord in human form. The other two were angels, as you pick them up now then in chapter 19. But from all outward appearances, so far as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were concerned, they were men. They had no idea they were angels. All right, over to 19 again. So Lot says, Behold now, my lords. Lot sees them as men. Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. Wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your way. And they said, Nay, we'll abide in the street all night. Boy, poor old Lot. You remember when I was back in Genesis, I said, put yourself in Lot's shoes? Oh, I'd hate to have been in his shoes, because, see, he knew what was going to happen. But he was hoping that he could get them inside before the citizens of Sodom would find out that two strange men were in town. But they wouldn't let him. Angels, of course, knowing why they're there. In fact, when I teach this chapter, I always say this is God putting Sodom and Gomorrah on trial. These two angels were sent to let the Sodomites prove that they were going to be worthy of their sudden destruction. And they sure proved it, didn't they? Well, anyway, verse 4, Before these two men laid down, the men of the city, they were the ones that were interested in them. Isn't that plain enough? And that, of course, is where we get the term sodomy. The first scriptural account, of course, as evident as it is here. There are other places where I think it's implied, but here it's so evident that the Sodomites were only interested in a sexual relationship with these two strange men. All right, back to Romans. Of course, you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroyed it, and we're going to see in a minute that the New Testament attests to it. All right, Verse 27, then again, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, working that which is unseemingly or unnatural, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error. In other words, they're going to reap what they sow, one way or another. And the recompense of their error, which was meat. Now keep your hand in Romans and turn back with me, if you will, to Second Peter. The little epistle, way at the back. Second Peter. Chapter 2. <coughs> All got it? Second Peter, chapter 2. Now again, this is graphic language. I don't see how anybody cannot understand it. 2 Peter chapter 2, go back to verse 5, we're dealing at the flood. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow. Now again, that wasn't the wrath of God per se. It was a disciplinary action because he didn't really make them suffer like they will in the tribulation. It was just an instantaneous wiping out Sodom and Gomorrah and it was plowed under. They haven't really proven that they found Sodom and Gomorrah yet. Some archaeologists are convinced it's under the Dead Sea, but nevertheless, they haven't been able to excavate and bring Sodom and Gomorrah out where tourists can walk down its renovated streets. But it was instantaneous destruction of those wicked cities. All right, read on. Making them a what? An example. Now, an example is an example, and it's to tell us something. And we are never to forget that the reason God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah was because of it was homosexual lifestyle. And the world is never to forget it. But they do. They seem to. And then read on. It's to be an example unto those that should hereafter live ungodly. Oh, God is telling the world tonight, look what I've done to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what I've done <coughs> to those kind of people. Wake up. And then, 
If you want to see what God thinks of their lifestyle, this is what verse 7 says now. And he delivered just or righteous Lot, who was vexed or was constantly in turmoil over the, what's the next word? The filthy manner of living of the wicked. That's what the Bible calls it. Now remember what I said before. I'm not being judgmental. I'm not looking down my nose at these people. I'm simply saying that, but for the grace of God, I could be where you are. But by the grace of God, you can be out of that and you can be where I am is where God wants you. And that's why Paul makes it so plain in Romans 5 and Romans 6 that where sin abounded, I don't care how vile the sinner, God's grace can be greater. There isn't a soul living on this planet so steeped in sin and wickedness that God won't save in a minute and put his feet on a rock, clean up his life, and make him a trophy of his grace. And that's what he wants. That's what he wants. But you see, like the scripture said, they walk it underfoot. They do not want to be bothered. All right, back to Romans 1. Verse 28. Once they get into this lifestyle, which begins, of course, with an idolatrous heart, they may not have to fall down and worship a Buddha or something like that, but they've got some sort of, a, of an anti-God attitude. They've got some sort of another thing that takes God's place, whether it's secular humanism, whether it's atheism, or whatever they want to call it. Something takes their mind off of the Creator God, and they hold the truth underfoot. All right, verse 28, and even as they did not like or want to retain God in their knowledge, God again moves in judicially, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now you and I look at some of these things, we wonder how can people do this? Well, God has removed all restraints from them, that's why. There is no inhibition in their personality. They don't care what people think. They don't care what God thinks. See that? But it was a judicial act. Just again, I always take you back to Pharaoh. Every time that Pharaoh said no, God judicially put him on the spot that was even tougher. And every time, it hardened him all the more. All right, now then. God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They're not normal. They are not that which enhances society or enhances a community. It's going to have its effects sooner or later. Now, reading on down, these are not pretty verses, and I know they're not. I wouldn't dare to tell somebody that this is what they're like, but God can. And God's Word says that they're filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. In other words, I think that word means more than just plain immorality. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. They'll argue over anything. Deceit, malignity. Whisperers, backbiters, haters. Isn't this awful? Like I said, I wouldn't dare tell anybody that this is what they are. But God does. Haters of God? Oh, you bet they hate God. They may not just come right out and march with placards saying they do, but down deep in their heart they do because they know they're in opposition to what he wants them to do. Disobedient to parents? Does that ring a bell? without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. My, every time you pick up your paper, what do you see? Child abuse, incest. What's causing it? They don't have natural affection. It's gone. Implacable, can't reason with them. Unmerciful who knowing the judgment of God. What does that say? They know what's coming. 
they may try to deny it, but they know, knowing the judgment of God that they who commit such things are worthy of death, not only do they do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. And another translation, may you may have it in front of you, they applaud others who do these things. They cheer them on. Always have to remember way back when the filthy pornographic movie Deep Throat was in the news. And I don't remember the name of the gal who was supposedly in, uh, in the lead uh, position, a Linda something or other, but Harvard University, one of our primary seats of higher learning, had her a guest speaker in one of their convocations at that time. And when she walked on stage, they, the Harvard students and so forth, gave her a standing ovation. Unbelievable. Now that was way, way back, what? The late 60s, early 70s? Now I've already mentioned something again that just opens up another whole line of thought. Never forget that those very places of learning that are now the hotbed of such immorality such a hotbed of leftist political thought were once seminaries teaching this book. I read a quote yet just the other day by one of the former presidents, I think it was of Yale, and I couldn't have said it any better. Couldn't have said it any better. But look what has happened. They have just totally gone down the other direction, ridiculing this book, ridiculing anything concerning God, and will applaud those that live a gutter lifestyle. Now, I maintain we're not going to turn it around. I do not see a great nationwide, worldwide revival. I, I just can't see it. We may slow it, and I think that's our prerogative. Indeed, let them call Christians the greatest hindrance to progress. Well, if hindrance to progress is maintaining a moral fabric that can hold together, then I'm going to be proud of the fact that I'm hindering. But this is what we have to do. We have to hold back these forces of iniquity until God comes. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.